Today is uh, Wednesday, um, May the 8th, and my name is Margaret Bauer, and we are sitting in the home of Jim and Bev Pine uh, at 191 Pond Street here in Hopkinton. Um, and it is about 7 o'clock in the evening. So, um, Jim, I, I just, we wanted to talk a little bit about how long you've lived here and what it was like growing up here and any stories you may have about living in Hopkinton. Well, I've lived here all of my 70 years. I've never lived any place but in Hopkinton, Mass. I grew up in the center of Hopkinton on 77 Main Street. I uh, went to the Hopkinton schools and uh, I've been here ever since. Uh, and as I thought about this interview and thought about the changes, certainly uh, from 1942 when I began until probably uh, 1960 when I finished high school, Hopkinton was a small um, community and most people worked out of town. Most men worked out of town because there were very few jobs in town. Most women, wives, mothers stayed home and raised their children and maybe had school hour jobs locally or that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it had always been that way. Uh, the jobs, there were, there were a couple of factories in Ashland, there was a lot of work in Framingham, so men would head off to those jobs in the morning and return at the end of the day. And unless you worked for the town or some of the small businesses in town, you went outside for, for employment. Not to Boston so much then, or more locally really, but not... I think that they went to the Denison and the Fenwall, and as I say, those were plants in, in Ashland and in Framingham, and uh, there was bus service in those days. You could take a bus from the center of Hopkit into downtown Framingham and, and so forth. And uh, I'm sure there were some who, who went to, uh, to the Boston area perhaps, but uh, not compared to today, you know, where the... Uh, everybody. Well, it's it's so totally different because uh, I suppose in in the mid 1960s when they built 495 and initially it didn't change Hopkinton at all. In fact, for a few years it actually ended from the north at West Main Street until they continued it in a southerly direction. Uh, but and at that time the town of Hopkinton built what we now know as South Street to be a, a commercial road mm -hmm. and and. And of course, it's just exploded, particularly with the arrival of EMC Corporation. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I think about, for example, is the uh, the horribles parade on the Fourth of July. Used to be a big event, a big event for people, and bonfires at night, and it was it was a big celebration because everybody that lived in town stayed and got involved. And they would be, you know, homemade floats and bands and, and the like. And, and, and now the horrible parade is very fitting to its name because the parade probably lasts six minutes and it's mostly fire trucks and uh, three floats put in by the McIntyre family who always made the parade happen. Uh, but nobody is there to watch it because, Aww. well, everybody leaves town and goes to the Cape or Winnipesaukee or whatever they do. It, it's just it's just a whole different lifestyle than mm. it was uh, when I grew up. How did that name come about? I don't know anything about the history of the Horribles Parade. Well, I, I don't know how, it, how the name was created, but the Horribles Parade was always a spoof on... Uh, maybe political things going on in town or some kind of controversy and people would create these floats on on trailers and uh, uh, you know take take aim at thing there was never anything serious about it but uh, uh, you know I can always remember uh, for example in uh, sometime in well in the middle of the 50s I would guess um, at that time, we had two schools. We had the center school, and the building that's at 85 Main Street was then the old high school. Mm -hmm. It was the high school. Well, the town had decided to build a new high school up at the intersection of Grove and Hayden Row Street. And as that was taking place, when we had the horrible parade on the 4th of July, a guy had this huge tractor trailer truck in the parade, and with a great big piano that said, if you think this is big, wait till you see the new school. So it was just, uh, it was always lighthearted and, 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 and fun. And it sounds like fun. Yeah. 
but it was well attended and, and, and looked after, and now they just they can't get people involved, I oh, think, you know. Oh, that's sad. But, uh, so that's one way things have changed. How, how, did, how was the school before the big one was built? How, how was the school when you went to school there? Well, uh, obviously, um, somebody decided they were overcrowded, which, which they were. I can remember um, they were building that school, and it was going to be completed uh, at the end of December. Uh, so I started the eighth grade, I guess it would have been, um, in the basement of the town hall. And from September until that school, and then during the, during the Christmas vacation, we moved up to what was then the new junior senior high school. Where it is now? Well, the middle school, so-called, is, is, was the new junior senior high school. So that then. was in the 60s? Yeah, no, I think that was in the 50s. Yeah, that would have been like the mid-50s that they built that school. And, uh, you know, the, there were no facilities around the high school, for example. I mean, there's a little league park behind it, uh, but there was no uh, football field or gymnasium or any of that stuff. So they, they had to keep up with the times and build a school that provided all of those things. By the time you finished high school, was it finished? And Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you were one of the first students to well, graduate? Well, as I say, I, I went there, it was junior and senior high school, so it was grades 7 through 12, and I went there as an 8th grader in the middle of the year and eventually graduated from it. But, um, you know, and, and I don't think it took too long before it was full. It seems like the classes were getting larger by the year, at that time anyways. Mm. Do you still know some of the people that you knew in school then? Are they still around or not too many? Uh, there are some that are still around, yeah. Um, a lot of them. And I think that's one of the other differences. Uh, up until some point in time around then, people lived here, worked here, married here, raised their family here. Nobody really left. And then at some point in time, it's like kids left. They graduated from high school, they went off to school, they never came back, mm. you know. Um, but but there are surely are some uh, that are still in the area. You know, it seems, and I might be wrong, but it seems that, that there was a generation, and I think it was my generation, that that kind of started happening, that no matter what town you grew up in, people just started leaving and families yeah. became, just spread throughout the country. Pretty much everybody I know, they just don't live, to, you know, their families aren't real close geographically any longer. So I don't know if it was just a sign of the times, it was necessarily just for Hopkinton. I don't know. Um, how did you two meet then? Was that? We've just known each other always. <laughs> he was my brother's best friend. Oh really? In in school, like grade or high school? After no, school. he was a little older than I, and he actually worked for my father at one time, and I, that's probably when I first knew him. And what did your father do? He started a business of you know contracting and eventually some construction and, and stuff. So he had trucks and equipment and so forth, which we still do today. And your best friend worked for your dad? He did, yeah, he did. And then he went long haul trucking, and uh, but we had boats and we water skied and, and so forth. My family had a place down on Lake Maspinock and that was just a gathering point for thousands, it seems. And uh, every so, summer, all summer. So stuff. you really have known each other? For your whole life? Yeah. That's so nice. And you've been married for... Pardon me? Tell me about your father and mother. We've been married. Thank you. <laughs> for 45 years. We. Huh? Yeah, we have. You've been married for 45 years. Right. And your father and mother? Uh, well, they... Uh, they obviously raised us in, in, in the town. Uh, he started, or they started that business, I would guess, in, you know, during World War II or towards the end of it or something. You know, one of those businesses where you had a little broken down dump truck and no matter what somebody needed, whether it was to get their trash hauled away or something, and, and you know, eventually he had employees. And, so he was a handyman? Kind of well, a commercial handyman, okay? I mean, when I was a teenager, I know we used to put water mains in and dig cellar holes and hot top driveways and that kind of stuff. And, uh, he How was, was pardon? What was your father? What was he? Yeah. He was my father and he was the fire chief. Oh, was he? Yeah, I he didn't was, know that. Yeah, he was the fire chief from about 19, 
I guess the early 1940s uh, until 1964. Wow. Yeah, a long time. We, we, that was his full-time job at no, that? Or was... Was, no, everything was volunteer back in my really? growing up time. The fire department was totally volunteer and, and so forth. And in fact, he convinced the town that it was time to have some full-time firemen. So sometime during his tenure way, uh, they agreed to, to have two paid firemen, uh, and, and it began. And, uh, two? <laughs> yeah. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it was one of those things, again, I said earlier, that so many people worked out of town. Uh, if you have a volunteer fire department or a volunteer or anything, when you have an emergency and you sound an alarm They're not and there. nobody shows up, it's not good. No. You know? So that at least helped with the daytime problem, and, and yet it grew from there. But uh, and, uh, he, he uh, ironically, and, and we live right next door to the fire station, and, and uh, my mother had died in, in July of 1963, and one February night, seven months later, our house caught on fire. Your own house? Yeah. And Right next to it. And right the, next to the fire station. Yeah. And was your father home? Yeah, he caused it. He fell asleep smoking a cigarette, and he died from it. But uh, seven it, months after your mother died, yeah, how old were you then? Twenty. How many children were in your family? Uh, four. Were you the oldest? The no, oldest? I was the second oldest. I had an older brother and two younger sisters. What happened then? How were how old were the girls? Your sisters? Um, the older of the two was. Probably 19. She was in uh, Emanuel College in Boston. We had a little sister, nine, and I uh, said my older brother, who happened to be home. He was in the uh, he was in the army. He drove a truck for the army, and he happened to be home that night. And uh, so we got the little sister out an upstairs window. And your so, brother did? Yeah. Yeah. What a nut! Were you were you you must have been home. Oh yeah. And you you were able to get out. Yeah. What a terrible day that must have been. It was, it was a lot of a lot of terrible days, oh, and it was the middle of a, it was a howling snowstorm, and and at that time we had a fleet of trucks and snowplows and sanders, and we had a section of the mass turnpike that was our responsibility to keep clear. Obviously, there was no phone to be answered because this started at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh, it started in the middle of the night. Mm. Everybody was asleep. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. What happened to your family then? Did the house burn to the ground? Um, no. It was amazing. It, it completely destroyed everything inside the house from the intense heat. But the, the shell of it survived. And, uh, you know, eventually the house was uh, was restored. It took you know, six months or something like that, but... Um, and what did you do, the children? Did you have aunts and uncles, or did you...? Yeah, we did. There was a lot of... Uh, a lot of family in town. Um, I think my little sister paid the biggest price for that, because... The nine-year-old? Yeah. I mean, we weren't automatically the world's best parents and decision-makers. <laughs> you were and, 20. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it just... It just did a job on her, I think. Did you stay together? Were you able to stay together? Yeah, we did. It's a uh, miracle. We, we rented an apartment up on Church Street in, in the center of town. And How'd you pay the rent? Well, we worked. Oh, you my know? goodness. <laughs> I mean, we had a business to take over and, and uh, stuff, but... That's quite a story. Yeah, it is. And I, I, uh, I recently said to Bev, because our son got... Uh, had a series of incidents involving a close friend who was dying and they got in a car crash on their way to Pennsylvania and you know a lot of negative things but I said to her afterward and I can look back and that time in my life I said I I just have always felt a little more qualified to come alongside someone going in some kind of tough time because we went through some and, and, and there's something idea. about going you know people always say well you know, how, how did you do it? Well, number one, you don't have any choices, okay? It's not like you can First, say, well, I'd rather do plan B. Right. <laughs> you know, you, you better go get some clothes somewhere because you don't have any. Yeah. And, and, oh, you know, all of that, that was burned. I mean, all oh. of that, you know, and, and, and so forth. And not to mention, you know, your photographs that you had and all of your toys. I mean, at 20, probably, I don't know, maybe books or... 
everything. I can't. Yeah, I think that was the big thing. Things like school yearbooks and and, and all of that stuff. Oh, you know, photo oh, albums memories. and stuff. And and uh, they were just all destroyed. You know. So did the did the town kick in? Did the family kick in? I mean, did how did were you kind of on your own? Um. Well, from the business standpoint. Uh, Fellow that married to my cousin by the name of Dick Stewart worked for my father as a as a foreman. Uh, he became a, a partner in the business with us, and uh, you know he was you just couldn't have a better partner and, and so forth to help. Was that your father's business or did yeah? That but was he the fire chief at the time that yeah. this happened? But he oh so it was voluntary. He had his other business too. Yeah. It was other business, how I made a living. The fire department didn't pay anything, you know, that was, you strictly did that as a hobby. I mean, we were all volunteer firemen. It's just part of growing up in a little town, as far as I can remember, Yeah. And, and so forth. But, so then you carried the business on with this partner? Yeah. Is that the business that you have now? Yeah. And it's sand and gravel? Yeah, crushed stone and so forth. So that's been 50 years you've had that? Yeah, really more than that. I mean, I've had it, it'll be 50 years next March that I've owned it, and, and it was in existence for 20 years before that, so wow. it's been around for a long time. It has. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's quite a story I didn't even know. Did you know each other at that time? You did. So then, what at what age did you get married? Were you in your 20s and start your family then? 26, I guess, 1968, we got married. And you had how many two. children? Just two children? Yeah. Oh, I don't know why I thought you had more than two. We have five. Oh, you have five. She had three, and we added two to it. Oh, cool. So you have five all together. Right. That's nice. And then when did you move um, to here to Pond Street? 1968. Oh, yeah. so that was early on. Yeah. You built this house. You built this house yeah. Yourself? No. With, uh, well... I did the... The earthwork, but I don't know. We hired somebody to build it. Did Did you design it? Or yes, I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> that's nice. I'm, that's I'm not a house designer, but yeah, for the but most that's... part, it's work. But uh, has it? Have you added on to it since then, or is this the way it was in in '68? Oh no, um, I mean it was just the basic house with the garage, and we added the room for Donna because of her needs. Uh, you know, this was just a deck at one time, and. And, you know, I mean, so there's been you built it over many years, you know, tennis court and a swimming pool, but you know those all all came a little bit later. Yep. So that means you've lived here in this house for forty-five. Years. Forty-five. I'm trying to do the math. Would you believe I'm an accountant? <laughs> Carry the one. Forty-five years, right. and you raised your family here. Yeah. And you've always been. You've probably seen a lot of changes. Has this neighborhood changed? Oh, not a bit. <laughs> we were out in the boondocks. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, Nave's house was there. Um, Dr. Love's house is the house you're looking at when yeah. you come down school street. Yeah, I know not his the house. house. that he died in, but, you know, the Loves were senior people here. Uh, and, you know, some of the older houses, but houses were few and far between, and there were no subdivisions. Yeah. But, uh, and so you've seen a lot of that change. Yeah, and participated in it. And, uh, you know, we're here because our company bought this 60 acres of land because it had gravel on it, and that's what we do. Oh, this land here? Yeah. I didn't know that. This, that back field was a great big hill, and there was another one further out that was a big hill, and we made it flat. Didn't know that. Yeah. So you actually did the business here? Well, yeah, I mean, we still do that. We go places where there's a hill of gravel, and we take the gravel out and make the land flat and process the gravel to make products out of it. So was this the land that had gravel, or was it over there? Um, well, it was from the fence out to the trees. Looks it's, nice. It's, I mean, that's, that's a yard now. Yeah. But it was a hill that was probably 35 feet high. Really? Wow. Yeah, and there was another bigger one down in the back that that was the original source of material, but we carved a house lot out of it and, and uh, built this house. And that, and did you build the other house that's in the front? That no, that was there. Was that one there? And, you know. Old. Yeah, I mean, that's got round beams in the basement, and 
that just came with the property. It had no plumbing or wiring or anything like that. And, uh, really? Yeah, and there was a barn with it that was fallen down, so we we helped it fall down and get rid of it. And did you live in that house first? No. no. Did you did, so you didn't move here till this was built? Right. Right. Oh, I can't imagine living somewhere for that long. It's nice though. It's home. Did you know that um, when our house was moved, when it had been up the hill, were you was that in the sixties? Well, it was moved before we got here, but not terribly long. And I knew briefly the doctor that lived there. Why did that happen? I don't know why they moved it or what the story was behind that. Do you know? I, no, I don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> it just oh. And I knew that there were some chicken farmers that owned it when it was up the hill. There were Armenian, but other than that, I don't know what right. what happened about the move and why that happened. So the neighborhood has changed. The, the town itself, have you seen it change in different ways as far as... The... Oh, everything about it changed. Um, you know, we went from 4,500 people to, I think the number's somewhere around 15,000 now. Um, and, you know, the facilities, the needs, um, which continue and continue to be um, always a source of controversy at town meeting and, and, and questions. Um, you know, when is it time to add the next whatever to keep up with the demand? And, uh, you know, I spent nine years on the department. Uh, Board of Public Works, and uh, it was like pulling teeth to try to add an employee. You know, and we've added miles and miles, not we, but people build a subdivision, and that's a mile of roads, and then they become public roads, and they need to be maintained. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the same be it the schools or the police or the fire department, and, and, you know, when I think back my growing up years as a volunteer fireman and my father's station wagon was the ambulance and you know <laughs> god help anybody that needed medical attention because <laughs> we weren't very qualified and and uh, you know was there a doctor in that part of downtown on main street was there one that everybody yeah. went to or yeah. he came to your they probably made house calls back they did. then back then yeah. dr joe even dr love made house calls uh, for part of his career and then he he stopped as they all did, but uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that the ambulance service that we have in in Hopkins and the EMTs and now paramedics, uh, just fantastic advancement, you know. Um, but it's expensive. Sure. You know. Yeah. And as, as we all know, it's expensive to keep up with those things. Yeah. But, um, and, and try as they might, they they, they they don't always manage to stay abreast. You know, I mean. Uh, Highway garage. I just read in the paper today that they uh, they've approved some funds to design a new one. Well, that one's 50 years old, and the equipment that we had 50 years ago is tiny compared to what they have today. It doesn't even fit in the building, and and so forth. And keeping up with the environmental demands mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. uh, it's just uh, so much to it. And you know, it's all magnified. I. I, my take, we're in our seventh year of the worst economy that I've ever seen, and um, obviously that applies to municipal as well as private. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, and I, I, I think back again to those years before I was involved in town business at all. And we had a Kiwanis Club, and um, I think what we didn't have was those uh, open meeting laws. And, and I know the Kiwanis used to meet at Carboni's on Monday night, and I was not there, of course, but I'm just sure that all town business was decided on Monday night at Carboni's, <laughs> <laughs> and it was ratified the next night at the Selectman's meeting. <laughs> Today you would simply go to jail for that. But <laughs> I was just going to say, those but, times have changed a little bit. That's but, all, but I maintain that those people did a good job because they made Hopkins in a place that a lot of people wanted to live in, yeah. you know, and and consequently that happened. I mean, as I said, 495 and, and other things have certainly played a role in that. But um, how did uh, you mentioned earlier that 495 didn't really change things? That, that surprises me. I would think that would have changed things drastically. It didn't change things immediately. Ah. Okay. 
I mean, it was not a heavily traveled road, and, and, and really, I think, until it was completed, and it, then it began, you know, and 128 got kind of built up and filled up, and so everything moves from east to west, and, you know, when 495 started to go and land values went up and, and people began to build, especially on South Street, uh, then it had a dramatic impact and, and, you know, we started building lots and lots of houses in Hopkin and, and expensive houses. Mm -hmm. and, and there really, I think, was good and bad to that. I mean, people are entitled to build what they can afford. I always felt bad I had a downtown full of widowed aunts and they all lived in the house where they had lived with their husbands, but they all passed away first. And, and then we had to put in town sewer. Well, if the sewer wouldn't buy your house, and you didn't have any choice in the matter. All of a sudden you had this huge betterment fee, and you know, you're a, an elderly widow on a fixed income. Oh. And, and so I think it was rather counterproductive for, for those people. You know, and the, and Did they get priced out of their own homes? Or could they not afford to live there any longer? Um, well, you know, all of a sudden they're faced with this debt. Now the town made it as workable as they could. There was something that was uh, like spread over 20 years and just maybe attached to their tax bill or something. And uh, if something happened, if they sold it or they passed away, then at that time their, their betterment would get paid up. But... Uh, and if they hooked on, and, and in most cases they probably had to, and that was another bill to be paid. If you just had a septic system or a cesspool in those days, it was your own. You didn't pay anybody for it unless you had it pumped, but now you get a sewer bill and a water bill and, yeah. and stuff. But it's, yeah. again, it's just, it's just part of growth, yeah. you know, but it's a, it's a difficult one to try and make it be fair always. And, yeah. How have you seen the, um, the the people, the face of Hopkinton change since, I, I know, I don't know if it was completely a, a farming community when you were growing up, or if it was kind of getting away from that by then. Well, for me, personally, I remember saying to Bevy the last year or the year before that I can now tell her that I do not know a single one of the five selectmen. <laughs> For the whole rest of my life, you know. I, I always knew all the selectmen and all the office holders because they all grew up in town, and I knew them. I went to school with them, and and, and so forth. And, and it's uh, and I don't say this is wrong or it's a criticism, it's but it's people it that have moved into town, and uh, you know, I, I always was partial to townies, anyways, as long as they did a good job, and, yeah, and so forth. But yeah. it's it's just the way it is, and. And, and maybe in some ways, those town leaders are more educated because they are more educated. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, these were just guys that were, as you say, farmers or people that work with their hands or cut firewood, and they did the best they could. I, and, and mm -hmm. I take my hat off. I think they did mm -hmm. a, a really good job. That's interesting how the how the face of the the town government, at least, has changed. It's all still voluntary, though, isn't it? All the yeah. Yeah. Well, we've created in, I don't know, 25 or 30 years, uh, a lot of paid positions because At town there were full-time problems with part-time people trying to solve them. And uh, because I have to do with the construction industry and, and sell to people that put in septic systems, for example, um, if they had to wait for the inspector who had a regular job somewhere and to come by it you know after supper or something to go to the next phase of the job it was could really slow things down oh absolutely yeah you know yeah and, and uh, there was a, a discussion about uh, you know this is years ago whether we needed a town engineer or a town planner and they opted to have a town planner you know now we have both plus a town manager and an assistant manager and you know a school superintendent and Know, 37 guidance counselors and you know we, we have an awful lot of employees in town yeah. and I guess that's what happens when you go from 5 to 15,000 yeah a part of it you know hmm. well can you think of any um, tales that maybe since I um, called you a couple days ago that you remember either happening with your family or a certain holiday memories that you have of 
being in Hoppington that stand out to you? Something, anything in particular? Uh, no, other than, I guess we just grew up being really content, as I say. We were blessed to have a place down on the lake from the time I was just a kid. And, and uh, boy, we, we spent a lot of hours there, summers, and so did a lot of other people. I mean, it was a little small house and, and just a piece of ground, but it, we found a lot of enjoyment just getting together with, you know, people of all ages and, and uh, enjoying the water, enjoying each other. And, and Where so is that lake? Is... Right out on West Main Street. Oh, is that the one that's right, that you passed by coming down here? I didn't know the name of it. Uh, Maspinock or North Pond, I don't know which one is the official name. Has that changed a lot since you were growing up, a, a lot more development around the lake? Uh, well, what happened was it was a seasonal place. Most mm -hmm. of the dwelling places were just summer, summer. places. Uh, and little by little, people began to try to make Winter them year island. round, either by renovating the building that was there or by uh, tearing it down and building a new one. And uh, when that happened, I guess one of the things that prompted, uh, you know, Hopkin into take on a municipal sewer system was the need to have that around the lake. Because, you know, the lake is at the bottom of all these hills uh, and, and these, all the these is going septic in. systems would probably contribute to the quality of the water in the wrong direction. Uh -huh. But, but uh, you know, and, and they've maintained, and I see they're upgrading uh, Sandy Island, the town beach. Uh, you know, it's going underway as we speak, I think. Is that on that lake, that yep. same lake? Do you still have a, a house on, on the house on My that? My son lives there. He tore oh, down does a he? family cottage, and he built a beautiful house. And, uh, when you go down West Main Street, if you go up to the top of the hill, yep. and you go down the hill and you come to the lake, and you, you go by it twice, right? Yep. There's a causeway with water on both sides, then there's this piece of land in the middle, and the causeway, he lives in the middle on that. On that uh, and that's where your place was? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, so that's been there. You're, you've had a place there for a long time. Oh, yeah, since probably 1948. Nice. Has a lot of memories. Yeah. So does he have a family there now? It's now just he and his wife. You yeah. Know, they have three grown sons and they're married and gone off. So. Wow. Yeah. So you have how many grandchildren? We have five grandchildren. That's any great grandchildren? Yeah. Um, really? You seem young for that. Well, with the blended family. Um, some kind of had a head start, so, uh, so I guess there's, uh, there's three or four great-grandchildren. Really? Yeah. Is your family mainly still in this area for the most part? Geographically, are they in the Hopkinton area, your kids and grandkids? Yep, yep. Uh, my youngest daughter lives right next door. Uh, my son lives there on West Main Street. Uh, one daughter's in Ashland. Donna's at the other end of the house. <laughs> And one son is over in Minden. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That, that is nice and close. Yeah. That's a blessing, really. Well, I think it is. Uh, I think it is. And I, I, I know it is. Um, you know, my two grandsons next door, they, they go to uh, Whitensville Christian School, which is right on my way to work. So three mornings a week, I drive them to work. Oh, and to school? Nine and 15 years old. And uh, I get reminded to make sure that I drive correctly and talk about the right things. But, you know, beyond that, I, I, I've been a grandfather for 22 years, and I think was blessed to realize that, boy, that is a special and unique role to be a grandfather. And, also. And I learned, well, I learned from a, from a fellow who had a grandson and of his unmarried daughter, and uh, three days a week, he and his wife would take care of this five-year-old grandson all day. And, and uh, it's kind of a long story, so I won't bore you with it, but he told me, he says, you know, when the kid got into school maybe uh, 15 years old and there was an assignment given by the teacher um, to the whole class to write about either a person or a place or a situation that stands out in your mind. Well, he wrote about this house over in South Pro where the 
grandfather lived and you could you could build a house from his description and the kitchen where he stood on the stool and made cookies with grandma and the den where he and grandpa played Monopoly and the TV. But he said, but what I remember most, he said, they treated me like an adult. They listened. And I decided that old adage that children should be seen and not heard is totally wrong. Because how can you deal with whatever a child is dealing with if you don't stop and listen? And I, I really try very hard, as I say, my oldest grandson who now works for me, and he spent countless weekends and stuff. He was as comfortable here as he was at home. And so he'd help me work in the yard and we'd take a hike out in the woods. And I, it just always was on my mind to think that I wanted such a comfortable relationship that uh, sooner or later the controversy would involve his parents, maybe my daughter or my son. And I wanted him to have enough comfort to come to me and say, what do I, I do? need some help, yeah. you know, and 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 I just that is a special role. It it really is, and you know, if my grandsons lived in Indiana and I saw them, you know, once or twice a year for a week, you, you even with technology, it's not the same. It, it as driving the same. them to school three days a week, yeah. and you know, talking to and them. Some days it's a very quiet ride. Some days it's you know last night's basketball game or whatever, but then there's other times, you know. Uh, something will be on the radio that'll prompt a, a question and a, and a discussion. Just an opportunity to to steer them. God knows that kids growing up today need an awful lot of help. It's true. It's true. It's such a different world, isn't it? Again, when I was thinking about my growing up years in that small town, and I think, you know, as I look back, and, and this won't be accurate, but Every adult male in Hockenden was my father, my authority. They, at least on the outside, all stood for the same things, you know, morally and otherwise. And, and the guy in the barbershop or the gas station, he'd have come out and grabbed Jimmy by the nap of the neck if I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be. Well, boy, God forbid anybody would do that today Isn't because the, the kid has the lawyer on his speed dial and, you know, we'll handle this right and now. And then it's on YouTube and there's oh, 10 million views. You know, yeah, yeah. And a mother can't spank her child and, and all yeah. of this stuff. And we wonder why the world is just crumbling around I know. us. And, and I'm thinking... I know why. <laughs> we can all do our part, yeah. you know? You're right, you're and, right. And, and, and stuff. And, uh, Absolutely right. We make it a point at our house um, to have dinner every night. Because, it. I mean, everybody's doing their own thing and we're all busy. And I know a lot of families just don't really take that time but I think it's important and and sometimes the dinners are very quiet and there's nothing you know nobody's saying much or we're all tired and then there's every now and then you'll get that little pearl or you'll get an opportunity just like you were saying to to, to give some guidance or but I, you know to me that's the most important part of the day and it might only be 15 or 20 minutes but you know we do it every day yeah and, and I think that's just critical and yet you know I, I watched again my own daughter and son and those two little guys are, are athletic and, and that's great but you know there is a word no yeah. or choice yeah. you know and, yeah. and we don't have to play every sport and, you know every minute of every day yeah. and half the nights and weekends yeah. and, and, and so forth you know and I, I've always regretted that they did away with the blue laws because it, it sort of forced us, us as a Sundays. culture to have a a relatively quiet Sunday, you know, and uh, the yeah. rest of the days are noisy and busy enough, and, yeah. and now it's it's just another day. I know you're and, right. And, and, and you know, and, I know. And I think the family that does what you do, and especially during the growing up formative years, yeah. you know, um, it's so important, and you'll never get that time back, really. Bob Clark lived right around the corner on um, that U-shaped street. Oh, Cr Cranberry Cove? Yeah. Bob lived down there with his, with his wife, and they had four kids, I think, and at least three of them graduated from military academies. I mean, smart kids, and Bob, Bob's a super guy. I remember talking to him one day, and something about TV, and he says, my kids aren't really much for TV. They'd rather play chess and read a book and stuff. He says, but we do sit and watch the news together at supper time and talk about the what world we're watching. Know. And I thought, well, that's a great use of TV. It is. You know, even though it's pretty negative what's coming out of it, yeah. 
the kids are going to hear it sooner or later. Yeah. And they make it a point and an effort to dialogue with the kids and get their views and let them say, you know, and I thought. That's, great. That's a great idea, yeah, too. I thought it was super. I mean, yeah. it was a long time ago. But, um, Are they still there on Cranberry Cove, that family? I think so. I think they're down at the bottom, and his house sat back in, in the woods. That was all his land mm. and, and so forth. Uh, his wife, Anne. Mm. Uh, well, I, um, I, I want to just can draw this to a close, and then, and then we'll talk a little bit more. But this is um, this is going to conclude our interview for now. This is Margaret Bauer. I've been talking with Mr. Jim Pine, um, and it, today's date is May the eighth, two thousand thirteen. Because um, I, I want to.